Go ahead. Good afternoon. I will be talking about share wall analysis and uh, in particular the lateral distribution of or the lateral forces, how they're distributed within your shear wall within the building. Um, it's actually pretty simple, it's not as complex as it sounds. Um, the methods I'll explain today, they are used for approximations. Um, a lot of times for multi-story buildings, which is primarily used for, you will use uh, computer software to be able to um, accurately determine those shear forces in those walls. Um, the first thing we need to remember is how the forces are, um, how they make their way to those walls, and it's by your floors and your roofs, which is a rigid diagram. Um, by that, basically, what that means is that it doesn't move much; it holds, um, it holds its form, and because of that, it's able to distribute those forces into the shear walls. Um, the main, uh, or the way you can determine if it is a uh, rigid diaphragm for your floor and roof is this equation right here at the bottom, which shows that if your story drift is, or if your diaphragm drift is less than two times your story drift, and then it's considered a rigid diaphragm. That's the rigid floor and the roof diaphragms. Um, the second thing is for any building you can have shear walls in two orthogonal locations. If you think about it simply, you need to have one that faces east, west, and one that faces north, south. That way, whatever forces are gone to your building, it can handle in any direction or any direction of forces. The last and probably the most important thing is the detail of your connection. Um, how your rigid diaphragms are connected to your shear walls. Because if that connection isn't able to handle that load, then your shear wall, your shear wall basically won't be able to get that load because that connection will break. And the main part of my presentation is how to calculate your, or how to find your shear forces within those shear walls. Um, the main method that I'll be talking about is by your relative wall rigidity, or if you think of your stiffness, which a lot of us have done before. There are four methods of calculations, and like I said previously, they're all approximations. Some methods are better than others, some are used for different purposes, and you'll see that here in a little bit. And towards the end, I'll show you how to determine which choice or which method might be best for your building or whatever you are trying to calculate. So the first thing, and this is what all the methods are based off of, is the relative wall rigidity. <clears throat> In most buildings, the shear walls are um, thought of as cantilevers from the foundation. So if you think about it being how it's horizontal off of, off of, so off of the column, it's the complete opposite. It's just vertical off of the foundation. And the calculation of that rigidity kind of depends on the geometry of that wall. Um, most of the walls that we've done in school are rectangular. They're not very complex shapes. And whenever you get to those complex shapes, like I said before, you need to use those computer softwares to be able to accurately determine those forces. <clears throat> and not one of these accurate, uh, or not one of these estimations that I'll talk to you about today is not completely accurate over the full height of the building. So you can take portions of it and get somewhat of an approximation for that part or for the whole building, but in the long run, it's still not accurate. You can get a very good idea based on these calculations. Like I previously said, the walls are assumed to be cantilevers from the foundation of the building. Um, this is method one, and that's its main uh, aspect of it, is how to calculate based on the speaking cantilever. 
Um, the pros and cons of this is basically that the relative effect of that shear information on long walls, which means on longer walls it's going to be underestimated, so it's going to be conservative for those walls. But if you have a slender wall, it's going to be uh, on the less, less side. So basically it's going to have more force on those slender walls than it would on those long walls based on this calculation. <clears throat> and again, this method, along with a couple others, does not take into account the deflection except for at the roof. And some of the other ones only take deflection into account at that level or at that point. And this is kind of what I was talking about. So the bottom, so th think of this as a foundation, and this is your shear wall. This is cantilever from here. And for this method, you take a point load to the top or to the roof, and that's how you calculate the uh, relative wall rigidity with this method. And as you can see, your shear diagram is very simple, and your moment is very simple as well. And that doesn't look accurate as you would think that a building would have. And this is the equation to calculate. And it stays pretty much the same for most of the methods. Um, for method one and two, it's the same equation, but there are a couple of differences of how you calculate. Um, but it's basically the relative, the relative wall rigidity is 1 over the deflection. And this is what we take as the deflection. For this method, the height is the entire height of the building, which is, I guess, the entire building is going to order that entire wall is under consideration. And this stays the same. Um, we've all seen this before the moment of inertia, modulus, elasticity. The main thing that changes in here is the K value, which is the shape factor. It stays 1 for flanged sections and 1.2 for rectangular walls. And most of us do rectangular walls anyways. And that's just a fixed value. Uh, the shear modulus is taken as 0.4 of the modulus elasticity, uh, which makes it a Poisson's ratio of 0.25, which is uh, from my reading, it's neither conservative nor, uh, I guess, underestimating or overestimating. So it's kind of just like a middle value. Uh, if you want to compare it to steel, steel's uh, Poisson's ratio usually that varies from like 0.3 to 0.5. So this is a little bit less than that. Um, the other thing on this is that the shear and modulus of elasticity can be taken out um, because they're common, as you can see from here. So that's how you calculate method one. It looks pretty simple. Method two is pretty much the same. The main difference about this is how you calculate uh, the height or, or where you're putting that point load. Um, again, this uh, is considered as a cantilever, but if you, this, the main difference is that this takes it at the story level rather than the full height of the building. Um, again, the relationship between shear and bending moment ignores the full effect from the whole building, uh, just like method one. It does have higher shear deformations than you would expect, so it is basically a conservative way of calculating it. Um, unconservative for long walls and highly conservative for slender walls, completely opposite of method one. And again, it ignores the effect of the moments and some of the other things at all of the other four levels, except for the level that you're looking at. And this is a picture just to kind of explain how you're calculating or where you're calculating. So if, if you remember, that was the full height. This is just the height to the story or above the story where you're calculating that. Still a point load, and that's your shear diagram and your moment diagram. But as you can see, it's not your actual moment. It's a much lesser version of it. So it's the same equation. The only difference is the height. You calculate it to above your story level rather than the full height of the building. 
Everything else is the same. Case, uh, K values is the same for all four methods. Um, the shear module is still the same. And again, V and D can be removed because they are common terms. Alright, so this is the third method. And again, it still uses a cantilever. Um, the main difference about this is that you use distributed load. And there's two types of common distributed load, uniform and triangular. Um, it's just showing you triangular right here because that's kind of what you would see if you had wind force. So let's start at the bottom right at the top, and based on that, your shear and your moment. Alright, so if you have a triangular distribution for your building, but let's say you're doing wind, you could do that. If you have a uniform distribution, maybe it's something pushing up against the wall or anything like that, it's this equation right here. Um, from what you can tell, it's not a big difference except for the coefficients, and that's the main difference between those two calculations. And again, this method also ignores deflection at all the floors except at the top of the building. Alright, so method four. This is the most complex one, and right, because of that, it is the most accurate one out of all of them. And it's a combination of methods two and three. Method two was taking that point load at the story above consideration, and method three was the for the distributed loading. And the rigidity from this method is based on the deflection at the top of the floor height under consideration. So it doesn't have to be the full building, like we did in uh, 1 and 3. <clears throat> and because of that, since we're doing, or we're doing combination, uh, we do get a better idea of the shear and a better idea of the moment. Regardless of them being as accurate as they could be, it's just an approximation at the end. This is the equation. It's completely different than the other three since it's a combination. Uh, it does consist of two parts. So to calculate this first part, um, actually, sorry, to calculate the second part, you need to be able to calculate the first part. Did I say that wrong? Yeah. Anyway, so the equation is this first equation right here. It's pretty simple. You find your moments, um, you find your shear forces, um, as we've done before, and that's how you get your deflection. You find your rigidity at the base, is this equation, and C right there is calculated with your moment at the base over the shear force at the base times the height of the story of your consideration. Um, <clears throat> the one thing about this is if you're doing a low distribution at the very top story, it becomes the same as method three for triangular or uniform lateral distribution. Uh, this is an example uh, that you guys can see at the bottom, but that kind of shows the plants and the other little things about the walls that we're going to look at. This is the building, um, all concrete or masonry, and uh, that's how we're going to see how to calculate the relative rigidity of the building or of the shear wall. This is a floor plan. Um, with, with uh, lateral loads um, for calculations, you can take them as independent. So for north-south, you can have a lateral load, and then for east-west, you can have a lateral load. And that's shown that it's, it provides sufficient um, answer to the end. Alright, so they already did the calculations. Um, with this, we're going to do it with uh, a seismic force, and everything's already done um, for us. Everything's already calculated out the force of the levels, the shear force, the moment. Um, so, what I want to explain with this chart is how methods one and two are kind of a very basic approximation. Because if you look at it, how the shear force increases all the way to the bottom. But at moment or at method two, you only take it at a certain level, so you're leaving out all the other forces. And it's kind of like the same thing for method one. You're not taking into account the other things, you're just taking this full load on it. Okay, 
so it's very simple to calculate that relative wall rigidity. Um, this is just a wall that they picked out. This is from the book. Um, you guys can take a look at it. Um, it explains it a little more. And just calculate your moment of inertia, your area, and then from that, put that in the equation. As you can see, the V and E terms are not in there. Take that, just put it in there. It's just one over that equation. And you get a relative rigidity of uh, 0.00630. Now, what that means is if you put that over the sum of all the wall rigidities of the building, you get a proportion of how much shear force that wall actually takes. So that's what this number is actually doing. It's showing you how much shear force that wall is going to get. And based on that, you can calculate the amount of shear force that needs to handle, and that needs to be able to take. And that was method one, which was a very simple method. And method four was the most complex one that we looked at. It's almost, you do it the same way, moment of inertia, area of the web, which would be that rectangular wall or flange wall, and then you calculate C. Put in all those variables, you get a relative rigidity of 0 0.0371. Now, on most of the walls, even if you do method one or method four, you're not going to get that much of a difference, except for certain walls. Um, those walls are actually, I don't believe I have them in this example, but I said, do, okay. So, alright, so as you can see, this is method four, the relative wall rigidity over the sum of all of them. This is 0 0.0026, 0 0.0032, not that much of a difference. If you get to a couple others, let's find one here. Alright, so this one right here, this is wall 17.1429. 0.15, okay, that one's still the same. <laughs> no, there are some problems. Maybe it was in the other direction. Oh, it's too small for me to look at that. Anyways, there are some walls where it does do make, where it does make a difference, I swear. Alright, so the last part is determining what method to use. It all depends on what you're looking at. What wall you're looking at, what type of gloves you have, how much of a difference do you think it would make. It, to me, it's very logical. If you have a point load, you can use method one, method two. If you have a distributed load, use method three, method four, if it seems a little bit more, or if it's a little bit more complex, and you want to get more accurate thing. But at the very end, if it is, let's say it's a skyscraper, you're going to use a computer software to be able to determine it. Um, you get a good, might get a good approximation with this, but at the end, it doesn't take into effect of all the other forces that are going on in the building that are adding on to that shear force on that wall. And that is basically.